Dr. Richard C. Miller, you went to Claremont uh, College and you went to get your PhD. Uh, you worked under Dennis McDonald, so you're obviously a biased student of uh, McDonald here when it comes to mimesis criticism. Um, but you're not so biased, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you don't necessarily draw all the conclusions Dennis does, but you're playing on the same field. So there are a lot of people right now who aren't in our camp. Some are even skeptics who don't buy Dennis's Greek, Homeric, Iliad, Odyssey, or even Aeneid, Mimesis. Robin thinks there's a lot going on with the Aeneid and, and Mark and stuff. She's more convinced that there's probably more connection directly to that kind of contemporaneous Roman Imperial, Octavian, mm. Sons of Caesar kind of motif, but she gets it. There's Mimesis happening. There's something going on. There's rivalry occurring. Yeah. Uh, wanted to get your thoughts, crit criticisms maybe, and also positive responses to what you find in Dennis's work. So many people find it silly, and they're just like, the consensus says. They don't buy Dennis's uh, mimesis. And that's the first thing I usually hear uh -huh. is the whole fallacy of, like, what do the consensus of New Testament scholarship? I refer you back to our first video about that. What are your thoughts about mimesis criticism? Take yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for calling it a fallacy. I think it's absurd for any scholar to be pointing to that. Well, most of us don't think that. Well, yeah, most of you weren't trained to even explore that. Most New Testament scholars today couldn't, couldn't write a, a five-paragraph essay on anything about Homer. They, they've never studied it. They have no idea what they're talking about. So let's start with that. So where's that consensus going to be then? Let's, let's go out to the people who actually have spent some time with Homer that are trained in classics and have spent some time understanding the impressions and significance of Homer, the canonicity of Homer in classical antiquity, just how sacred and important these texts were to the Greco-Roman mind and psyche at the time. Once you start unpacking that and start immersing yourself in that world, the world that whence Christianity was first born and took, took hold in the ancient world, in the Hellenistic East, these urban cultural centers that are bustling with Homeric imagery. I just was reading uh, Pausanias's description of Corinth the other day. He turns the corner in there. He's writing. He's a geographer. He's, he's talking about this. It's basically four or five square mile area there. And uh, sorry, my dog. You were saying your dog, you know, obviously <laughs> came up and um, but you were emphasizing they're not trained in this. They're not aware of this. They're not reading this stuff. But then you're going into some examples. Yeah, these were the most famous and well-known stories in all of classical antiquity. Are we all on the same page with that in terms of New Testament work? Now, it's odd to me that we would be studying a religion that was born and raised in that context and yet ignoring its most cherished literary works. The converts in the empire were reared in this literature. Those that were educated were educated in this literature. This is where they learned their ABCs in, in the classical Greek world. And so... And if you, were a, if you were a writer, when you learned to write, you would use Homer as your template. So you would, they, this is how they were taught to read. And so if you go back into um, Paideutic training, that's their kind of their, their training in writing at the time. If you go back into that, you'll find that this, is, this was kind of the scaffolding on how you would learn to write. You would be using Homeric passages as kind of a scaffolding for your own literary effort. And, and so this was the commonplace, and, and there are a number of sources. You could go to Dennis's work, you go to mine. A lot of people just dis dismiss him out of hand, though. That's really upsetting. They don't go back and actually look at what he's claiming to, that he's seeing there. He's right. He is absolutely correct that that, that was the norm in, the, in, that, in that context, and that these stories would have been ubiquitously well-known. It would be hard to imagine any early convert to the religion not being well, well acquainted with that work. And so now the question comes, and here's where I might, Dennis and I, and I actually think in, in, in if, I, if he were here seated, he would, he would agree with me. In fact, I think we've had this conversation. Would everyone have picked up on all of these references that he's pointing out, the parallels and the, the different syntactical patterns that he's, he's seeing? 
No. Um, are all of the patterns that he's identifying accurate and correct and bulletproof in terms of, uh, you know, no. But once you, uh, once you admit that there are a few of them happening, it, once that camel's head is in the tent, the whole camel's coming in. Right? I 100% <laughs> agree. Yeah. And so now does that mean that that is the meaning for that passage necessarily? Well, there's the problem. Would would an ancient listener have picked up on each one of those uh, different subtle mimetic clues and cues that were there? Probably not. And so that's where we have to, I think, think of valence. And this is this is where I would come at it. Is I think that the gospel texts were written for different kinds of readers, not just one kind of reader was in their mind. They didn't have just one persona. Mm-hmm. They had a few different personae. And so one might be just the, the normal convert in the community who's maybe not lettered and maybe not well-educated. And there are plenty of Christians that would fit under that camp, probably most. There are also those that, that, that were more culturally f- sophisticated and maybe did go and hear readings of Homer and maybe did have uh, a, a more of a, a vivid kind of memory of what's in the, the, the epics. There are also more scholarly individuals. Those are the kind of the educated elite in the ancient world. They would have needed this in there. This was for them how, you know, for, to, to try to write a work in that world that did not uh, express mimetic sophistication would have been to, to write bad writing that would not have been terribly well, exp- uh, you know, respected in those circles which we know didn't happen. Hmm. The elites of the ancient world did embrace the gospels and that, and that whole world. And so that, that we, we know it made an appeal to them and it won. And in fact, it ended up eclipsing all of that prior literature and replacing it. So you have the entire mythos system of the ancient world basically being replaced with a Christian mythos system, which is really just almost a, in many ways similar, but with Christian decals over the top of it. And, and with its own kind of ascetic and own kind of ideological paradigm that it's, that it's following. And so, um, yeah. Well, quick thing yeah. on this note is that the first thing is the biggest sin is that, that most are not seeing this and that, that what you just pointed out. Another example, though, bringing up Litwa, since we had talked about our critique of that, is how Litwa wants to argue that there is a cultural uh, influence and he doesn't like literary playing a role in it. Mm. He loves to try and argue from just the cultural. Well, McDonald's, you hear the commercial, you you hear the jingle. They're on each corner, kind of like there's plays here and there's a there's a mosaic here and there's a that and this. And Dennis goes, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I'm saying and, and yeah. So I think Litwa doesn't want to go to that to that textual level of suggesting there's some textual sophistication playing with the literature. He thinks it's like a just a some hybridic cultural influence rather. Okay. And Dennis agrees that that's happening too, but it's like the most of the scholars I hear that don't fully go along with Dennis. They'll agree in the vein, like Lit will agree with the vein, but not go along with him. You know, are not wanting to go with the literary side. Personally, my opinion, no expert here, I agree that the the cultural, without a doubt, is going to play an impact on any society ever. But what is driving that cultural influence if it isn't the literature and it isn't the influx of the canonization of that material playing yeah. out in the cultic practices in the Greek and Roman world and the stories that told, the plays that happened, et cetera, and yeah. the writing. So... I think Dennis is on the money when we're dealing with literature, especially when I find a gospel and then I see another gospel that literally has 90% of that gospel being used, which meant they're somehow verbatim using this other literature to write their literature. I don't see him going, well, on the street corner in Corinth, I saw this uh, picture. So I'm, I mean, <laughs> being influenced by that picture yeah, in yeah, the culture, yeah. Yeah. they're literarily being influenced as authors. And I don't know why that's not being highlighted in Litwa's work or others about this mimesis. Right. No, I, I think that's well. First, I would say that anyone that's that's at least admitting that there's Homeric influence in the constructs of the New Testament has gone a long way good. from where the where the academy has been up to this point. And so, thank you. That's a good that's a good movement. I would commend Litwa for that. At least admitting that and seeing, okay, this is important. Um, and I would go there. And in fact, I would say I would agree with him that many of the most defining and framing contours of of the, like the story arc, for instance, in Mark, 
it's they're almost incomprehensible unless it's read with that anti text in the background that 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 canonical um, grand text of Odysseus's journey when he's the incognito king returning home. Okay, well, Jesus is the incognito king on his way to Jerusalem, and no one's supposed to know it. He's telling everyone to be quiet. And there you have the messianic secret, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and why is he hushing everyone? Why is he wanting every, no one to know? Well, it's almost incomprehensible to other New Testament scholars. They, they try to contrive why that's happening. It's hard. Like, what's the explanation? Well, if you're reading Homer, you know the explanation. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. <laughs> That's why when I read right. about Jesus casting the demons out of the demoniac yeah. into swine, swine that drown into the water of the ocean or the, the sorry, the, the sea yeah. of Galilee, which wasn't even a sea, Porphyry said. Um, I'm sitting here reading this and I'm going that I, I get that they think it's convoluted for you to think book think 10 and 11, or was it nine and 10? I can't remember, but it was the first, the Polyphemus situation with the Cyclops mm -hmm. and they he's eating the sheep and then they end up gouging his eye out and escape the Cyclops to go to Circe's Island where she turns soldiers into pigs. <laughs> yes. I'm Legion, which is Roman soldiers that are the swine in the swine. Thank you. Like yes. I, you can't, I don't know if you can get any clearer. Yeah. It's almost like the question I've had when I recently had a debate on my channel where the guy goes, all right, so you're telling me in, in Acts chapter one, verse 11, when Jesus ascends yeah. and they said, you see him with your eyes and you see him, he will come back in like manner, right? Like in the same right. way you're seeing him go, he's going to come back. This is the argument. And the other guy tried to allegorize by running to another passage that the Greek word where it says like manner. Well, mm -hmm. he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers a chick. So he wanted to try to allegorize that meaning of return, right? And then I'm using this example to get your point, to get to a point I'd love to get your, your point on here is the guy asked him in the debate and he never answered it, he dodged it. He goes, if he was trying to say that Jesus is going to come back the same way you see him go, mm -hmm. how, how would he have wrote it? Like, in what better way could he have made it clear without Xerox clearly copying with this mimesis here? Because that yeah. would have been a big no-no. Lucian right. would have been like, oh, hell no. We know what you're doing. Yeah. You're not being smart enough and sophisticated with your literature. Yeah. That is, there's so many signs in that one narrative for me. It's like the Eurycleia one. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, it's so mimesis in the ancient world was rarely advertised. It was rarely, you know, I think the most barefaced example we have is the Aeneid, the Aeneid over the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? It's its own kind of story arc that's very similar in terms of the sea journey and the founding of things and all this. And so, and, and that's a most, the most obvious, but most of the time when you find mimesis in the ancient world, the classicists find this what they're finding is that it's it's meant to be subtle it's meant to, it's supposed to be an inside joke it's supposed to be uh, difficult to see it's supposed to test your paideia it's supposed to be you know this is these are the clever little literary um, aspects of the text that are meant to you know to be an insider on the joke so to speak for those that are more sophisticated and that have read these things now the problem is if 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 we were to take Homer and Hesiod and say Plato and maybe a couple of Euripides plays and glue them to the bottom of your New Testament and have that be, you know, the traditional New Testament, no one would have any problem seeing all of this all day. You know, we might quibble over the details here and there and to what extent here or what it may mean, but I don't think anyone would be confused at all that, that this is going on. Right. And so now that's a big problem. When you get to the Sea of Galilee and the big storm there, you've got basically what amounts to a lake. You mentioned that a minute ago. With, you know, the divine elements and this raging tempestuous sea and, you know, a feckless crew, then he has to calm the divine element. This, this is basically lifted straight out of the Odyssey, you know, and there's no, that's not a sea, that's a lake. It's 100 feet deep. Okay? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, this isn't the high seas. And so let's get honest here. And so basically Mark and the Mark and storyboard is transforming this into a Homeric like scene with Jesus playing the role of Odysseus and the crew and, and all of that kind of relation there going on. And they're, they're not really, they're afraid and he's not, et cetera. And so that would have been obvious as well when he goes to the temple incident. Another inexplicable part of Mark, right? He's, he's going to throw out the money changers like, what, what's going on here? What, 
there are a number of things we could say about that, but not least of which is you've turned my father's house into a house of thieves, right? And so now when Odysseus is going returning home, this is the climactic scene. This is that mural that we were talking about that they found in Corinth and so many other cities, the climactic scene with Penelope's suitors, mm -hmm. where he's returning home and he's going to cleanse his father's house. This was the family estate, so to speak. He's going to drive out these individuals that were trying to suck all the money out of his wife while he was off at war and uh, and and trying to uh, curry favor with her in order to marry her while he's off fighting. And so he's coming back and saying, you guys are horrible. And then ha he comes back in disguise, the incognito king like Jesus, and and basically ends up, you know, beating them and 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 uh, proving them all wrong through his trial of. Bow, stringing the bow and shooting it through the axe heads and the, the classic scene there, right? And then he kills them all. And right. so that's the climactic scene in the Odyssey. That's the, you know, the, that's where the story finds its ultimate kind of moment there. And so it's a kind of similar in the story arc of Mark. You get to the cleansing of the temple and he's trying, it's his father's house, you know, and he's the incognito, incognito king. Now, was that historical? Was there an actual cleansing of the temple? Was there a man named Jesus that actually pissed some people off and, and flipped over some stuff and ended up getting arrested? Who knows? Possibly, you know, but certainly it's being fashioned in, in, Homer, in Homeric terms. And so I think... Uh, the intercourse that modern New Testament scholars are willing to allow with the Hebrew Bible, the classical Hebrew text, in terms of mimetic play in the Gospels, um, you know, that to me, it's, un it's unfair that they wouldn't also allow these other texts to also play a role. And that, I think, belies the fact that they were all raised with a, with a Bible that had all of those texts all glued together. And they thought that that was the way that, you know, that they were confining their investigation to that stack of texts. Or adding to the fairness of, of representing what they might think is that they'll say, well, it clearly signals it is written or thus saith the Lord. Like, and then it'll quote something we know scripture. Mm -hmm. And it's what they want. What I think they want is that clear evidence of it's written. So this gets into falsifiability one more time before okay. we get off of this. Okay. And that is, well, how would we know if they weren't, um, you know, mimicking uh, Homer? I, I personally, if I was to take a jab at that, I'd be like, well, don't have them casting out pigs into lakes on weird seas that aren't even seas that are just lakes. And like, and writing these things that seem quite fantastic that somehow mirror or have resemblance to what we're finding in these older tells that played huge impacts to the civilizations in which this literature is rising up on. Have them go into Palestine and like do it with dogs or like, you know, avoid it, yeah. avoid it. But instead yeah. they go, well, why would they do that when he really went to an actual demoniac who was in the caves cutting himself and they cast out demons? Like they've got to have that oh, historical. What an uncanny coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. Like I guess yeah. the God worked through this divine path. It's like the recent discussion I had with Michael Jones was like, he answered, I thought it was a really weird answer after I thought about it afterwards was like, well, if, if I were God or an alien and I wanted mm -hmm. to convince people of my truth, I would just ha I would come in working within the same mythic belief systems and cultic practices that everyone else does. So, so you have this divine birth of all these other people. Well, my mm -hmm. guy's going to have a divine birth. You, you have all these guys who die and go up to heaven. Well, my guy's going to die and go up to heaven. And like, and I'm going to myself and looking at that back and I'm like, I would stand apart if I really had the truth. That's getting off kind of of the point of this mimesis here. Yeah. But why why does it have enough resemblance for people like Dennis, you, Robin Faith Walsh, to see something going on here, but it gets kind of ignored or denied, and they really want to cherry pick. So some of them will go, okay, okay, we'll grant that kick against the goads is Euripides Bacchae. Okay. So what? That's the exception, not the rule. You see how they are yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to do it? Because they don't have a clear, it is written. They want that it is written. What do you say to that? How would you respond to that? Well, again, I think there's a theologically motivated, whether it's recognized and admitted or not, um, paradigm here that needs to be broken. And that's the idea that these texts are canonical and need to be sequestered off and read as special in some kind of a stack there. Now, they're willing to allow, okay, well, let's bring in some Jewish literature also. And that's, that starts to get pretty messy pretty fast as well. But 
they're not allowing the broader sea of Greco-Roman literature. First, that's a large project. And most of these scholars that are out in the field weren't trained in it. Most of them have never even read Homer, certainly not from beginning to end. You know, they might have cherry picked a, a line here or there, but they don't know what they're reading. Hmm. And so, and they certainly don't know the significance that Homer held over, over the mind of, of, the, of the ancient world. And so that, that to me is a, is a big red flag. And it's because these texts are sequestered and because up to this point, no one thought it was necessary to do all that extra work to understand the classical world the world where Christianity was born. <laughs> you mean you want to know about somebody you can learn from their parents? Oh, yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. No, I mean, the, so these were texts that were written, read, and consumed, and found their meaning in these cultural hubs in the Hellenistic world, where Homer was rife. There was, there was no avoiding it, you know? And so uh, it would be kind of like trying to avoid Star Wars today. Like, do you really know nothing about Star Wars? Really, yeah. you know, how how alien would you have to be from our modern Western context to know nothing about Star Wars? Right. And uh, and so there's an absurdity there. And this was so much more important to them than our Star Wars. And so that's that's to me a big deal. And so I, w- I would say that we need to you know what we do with that problem is is another question. But I would put to them this. How about let's try and list any group of texts from classical antiquity the Hellenistic period, the Roman period, that were not mimetic projects. Again, let's let's trot out that list. Let's see it. Because what classicists are seeing is that this is commonplace throughout. When Josephus wants, like I make this this mention in your other video, when Josephus wants to write his history, he models it after an already established, you know, antiquities of the Romans. He's writing antiquities of the Jews. And it's it's got some structural kind of there there's stuff there where he's using that as a scaffolding. I've even heard he has (laughs) Homer mimesis in his own writing of the history. So. There's yeah, and and Homer wars. I can't remember one of those, but it's clear. Just to go to the and this goes to the historicity problem in terms of the Gospels being handled as histories at all, in terms of how they were being received in early Christian communities. Well, almost immediately you get this effort to allegorize and symbologize, and and they're doing that left and in fact, so much so that any kind of historical kind of concern at all is lost, all all but lost, and so. If you want to do that, and and the only other place we see that popping up prior to the rise of Christianity in in the Greco-Roman world was in with Homer and Hesiod, the poets, the grand figures of that. So you find allegorizing of Homer going on left and right all across the board. And so what were they thinking these texts were? Thank you. I hope you liked my dad, Richard Miller, in this interview. Remember to like and subscribe. And never forget, we are Miss Vision. Coming in the air tonight.